Good morning, everybody. Um, a very welcome here uh, in this uh, snowy uh, winter in Vienna. <laughs> and also a big hello to everybody who joins us online. Uh, I'm very proud to uh, introduce to you uh, Emily Hallinan uh, for uh, today's um, year's lecture. And uh, I, I probably should give you a, sh a short um, background uh, to Emily. Um, Emily, yeah, I should probably start it few years back. Um, and he was born in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> the whole biography. <laughs> Same hospital as ours also. Anyway, um, uh, Emily uh, did her undergraduate studies uh, at the University of Cambridge uh, with uh, uh, Paul Mellas, among others, and uh, switched then for a master to uh, the University of Cape Town under the supervision of uh, John Parkinson. And uh, then finally returned to Cambridge for a PhD to supervise her master. And um, after her, uh, actually during her PhD and the survey work, uh, Emily was one of the first uh, researchers in South Africa who um, uh, discovered the uh, strange moving moving type force. And um, uh, she, uh, after defending her um, PhD, Emily uh, still worked a little bit for um, teaching at Cambridge uh, in uh, some of our classes, as well as briefly working at the <laughs> <laughs> so interesting things about your CV. And uh, uh, then moved on with uh, Marie Dr. Curie uh, Fellowship to um, Faro, to uh, the ICAREP, the Interdisciplinary Center for the Ecology and Evolution of Human Behavior. And uh, she uh, started uh, working on more intensively on the, let's call it the Nubian uh, during that fellowship. And um, she's continuing that now on a multi year postdoc funded by uh, the uh, Positive Science Foundation. I think it's okay. um, and yeah, so uh, thank you very much for, um, for coming today to us and to talk about Nubian complexity. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for the introduction, Philip. Uh, there we go. So uh, we'll begin by talking about Lavalwa technology, which I imagine most people are familiar with. But to recap, it's uh, prepared core technology uh, that's associated with the start of the Middle Stone Age uh, made by modern humans in Africa and the Middle Paleolithic made by uh, Neanderthals in Eurasia. And it's got many complex and nuanced definitions, but essentially it involves preparing a core to produce an end product of a predetermined shape. And this is something that I'm going to keep emphasizing is that shape is central to the definition of Lavalois and how we distinguish between different Lavalois reduction strategies. Um, and it's not just the shape of the end product, it's the, the complex geometry of how the core is set up that really underpins the concept of Lavalois. Nubian is just one specific uh, Lavalwa preparation method to produce a pointed end product. And in fact, this is how it was first defined and distinguished by Jean and Genevieve Guichard in the 1960s. I'll talk more about them in a minute. And they, they described it as a Lavalwa point core characterized by a special technique. So Lavalwa, although many of these methods are united by the same underlying sort of approach to preparing the core and its convexities, uh, there are many different methods and uh, one of the most common is the classical centripetal preparation, producing these tortoise cores for um, a, a preferential flake and methods of producing uh, points with unidirectional convergent preparation where you, from the proximal end of the core, you uh, create a Y-shaped scar that then guides the force through, through the rock to produce your, your point. So Nubian is really just a sort of a spin-off of this, um, and it involves various different uh, ways that all focus attention on the distal end of the core. And this is really its main defining characteristic uh, compared to other Lavalwa methods. Uh, so because different approaches to Lavalwa are quite uh, varied, um, and it became quite important to be able to identify Nubian Lavalwa as, as one of these Lavalwa strategies, but a, a very specific one, uh, Vitaly Uzik and colleagues working in Dofa in Amman uh, came up with a, an attribute-based uh, way of quantifying um, uh, the different criteria, that, the characteristics that define Nubian. And uh, because they developed this working on material in Oman, 
uh, a group of us met uh, more recently uh, working in Africa, the Levant and, and other parts of Arabia. And we thought it was appropriate to just refine the definition a bit more that took into account the, this broader area and some of its, its variations. So really, um, the, the criteria that, that define a Nubian as, as we're working, working with it um, are, fall into two different spheres, uh, those of technology and those of shape. Um, so its technological um, distinctiveness is that it has both a proximal platform for the main preparation remo uh, preferential removal, but a lot of attention is focused on the distal end. So a distal platform is installed on the opposite uh, end of the core, and it serves an alternate role to the proximal platform during reduction. Um, and it's this distal part of the core where, where the preparation is focused and various strategies of distal and lateral preparation um, as opposed to the unidirectional convergent where all the preparation is concentrated at the proximal end of the core. Um, so this produces quite a distinctive morphology, uh, particularly this steep distal ridge um, at the end of the core. And this is a really key feature in, in how we understand Nubian cores. Um, and generally this is, this is steep, so it's less than about 90 degrees. There's a bit of wiggle room um, on either side of this. And overall, the core has a pointed morphology, and it's for the production of pointed preferential end products. Although, as its name suggests, it was originally described in Egypt and Sudan, so Nubia, it's subsequently been identified quite widely. And this map shows a reported Nubian cores. Not all of them necessarily fit the strict criteria, but we'll just keep it simple for now. Um, and you can see quite clearly from the map that uh, Many of these occur in arid environments. You can see the desert, the the desert context there, um, and this is quite an interesting feature of them. Um, but of course, in the past, uh, these areas may not have been quite as arid as they are today. But it's raised some interesting questions about why we find it across such a broad area. There are a number of limitations with the uh, sites we have at the moment. Uh, most of these are surface assemblages, which is partly related to the desert context and very few are dated. Another issue when trying to tease out broader patterns is that we rarely find Nubian cores and their end products together in any substantial numbers. And the sort of technological packages that accompany Nubian cores are very variable. So there's no clear signature associated with Nubian cores. Um, and the fact that we found it in more regions outside of, of the Nile Valley, where it was initially sort of con appeared to be concentrated, means that we can no longer assume it's a cultural marker. And it's raised some quite uh, heated questions about what the relationship between assemblages with Nubian Lavalwa cores are, and whether we can identify scenarios of its emergence and spread. So broadly, these three scenarios that have been argued by different research groups are that of population dispersals. So one group, presumably beginning in the Nile Valley, we don't actually know, um, dispersed uh, across this broader region, taking their Nubian technology with them or cultural diffusion, where uh, one group who had Nubian technology uh, then interacted with other populations and the, uh, the technology was, was transmitted between them, or technological convergence, where um, the, the technology was in, uh, developed independently by groups maybe separated in time and space as a response to the same, uh, the same problem. And the reason that uh, it actually is sort of, of more relevance to, to people in the bigger picture than just those of us who, who care about Nubian cores, is that uh, it's happening at, uh, at, during MIS-5. The few dates we have, um, as you can see in the map uh, here, um, very, very few, and they cover quite a broad time span. But broadly, we're looking at MIS-5, and uh, this is quite a critical time frame for thinking about modern human dispersals out of Africa. And uh, there's a lot of debate over whether there was a northern route through the Levant or a southern route across the Red Sea. And uh, Nubian Lavawa has ended up uh, getting uh, embroiled in this debate, um, either because of its presence or absence. Um, and this sort of, um, this at the root of the debate, there are three main questions. Um, and these really boil down to whether it Nubian represents a distinctive Lavalwa reduction strategy, whether it reflects a widespread shared techno complex, and does it tell us anything about human behavior, evolution, or demographic histories? And just in the last three years, there's been quite heated debate uh, on the topic. 
So to sort of give you some more background about why it's become so so hotly debated, I'll just take us through uh, some of the sort of background evolution of the the, the cause understand the understanding of the cause and the terminology. Um, so in the early 1920s, when uh, Paleolithic expl exploration was really just beginning in Egypt, um, people were noticing a lot of surface finds, and the first publication uh, was by Seligman, who misidentified Nubian cores as tools, he called them tortoise points, and he directed attention towards the distal ridge and the pointed distal end of the core, um, but he, rather than viewing it as a, as a core, as the, end, the, the byproduct of producing a, a point, uh, he thought that the, the pointed distal end was actually used as a tool for sort of dragging or incising. Vineyard working at a, a similar time frame, um, he actually did identify the core preparation technique and uh, focused in on these distal blade removals. I should just say that throughout the talk, the cores are orientated in multiple directions because different people use different conventions. So I apologize for the inconsistency. It's not entirely my fault. Um, so really the kind of the, the crux of it became uh, within the 1960s with the Nubia campaign, which was a huge international rescue campaign uh, prior to the flooding of um, a large portion of the Nile um, to create the Aswan High Dam. And a team led by, there were many international teams, but particularly the one led by Fred Wendorf um, produced some of the kind of the, the initial defining works on, on Nubian technology. So the term was coined by uh, Jean and Genevieve Guichard in 1965, and they were students of Francois Bord, so they were very much into typology and naming types. Um, so they, they called them Nubian cores because they were, they were notably different to anything they'd seen in France. Um, and they identified two types based on morphology, um, not strictly on uh, technology. Uh, type one has distal preparation and type two has lateral preparation. Um, and these are 3D scans of some of the, uh, the cores that are currently in the British Museum uh, that were some of the original artifacts that they, um, that they, they studied. And as part of the uh, combined prehistoric expedition uh, led by Wendorf more, more broadly, uh, they weren't just identifying new artifact types. Again, following the board system, they were looking at different combinations of different artifact types to try and identify uh, industries in this unexplored area. And although the sort of the the pattern that patterns that they drew out are quite uh, complex and we don't necessarily um, continue to use them today, it was a really important first step in actually giving the region um, a sense of uh, sort of drawing out patterns. Uh, giving us something to work with later on. Uh, and Tony Marks and I recently recapped this uh, in a paper. So this, uh, from the 1960s, that we ended up with a, a number of different industries in the Nile Valley, and uh, it led Van Peer um, to do a big interregional study of about 45 different assemblages, quite phenomenal numbers of, of artifacts. Um, looking at um, variability of Lavawa technology across the whole of North Africa. And this led him to describe the Nubian complex. Um, and he, he placed that in MIS-5. And really this, this broad techno complex was supposed to be a sort of umbrella uh, to, as a counter to the regional fragmentation of all these smaller industries. And the, the, definition, of, the definition of it has sort of evolved slightly through time, uh, but broadly in its, in its uh, initial terms, it was characterized by Nubian cores that occurred alongside various tool forms, such as bifacial foliates and various retouched point forms. And uh, just in the broader context of the Sahara, um, there, are, there are low numbers of Nubian cores in many assemblages across the Sahara and um, also associated with Atyrian sites. Uh, now, the Atyrian industry is uh, an MIS-4 sort of phenomenon. And uh, whilst the cores um, occur in very low numbers, there are a number of points, classic Aterian points that have this, uh, the scars originating at the distal end, which is potentially indicative that they may have come from these distally prepared Nubian cores. The big turning point in the debate came in 2011 when Jeff Rose and colleagues identified Nubian cores in Dofar in Oman. Uh, and this is the first time they were really properly um, described outside of, of uh, North Africa. Uh, they had an OSL date to 106,000 years ago. 
and they proposed an Afro-Arabian Nubian complex that was linked by human dispersals. Uh, the, as Philip mentioned, I entered the debate in 2015, and in fact, the reason that I recognize these causes is because I've been to a talk that Jeff gave in 20, 2010, I think, in Cambridge, um, where I'd sort of seen these upside down cause as they seem to me. Um, I've done a lot of work in South Africa and actually finding any Lavalwa point cause was on the landscape was pretty rare. So when we found a site that had uh, more than 120 of these, we knew we found something a bit odd. Um, and we used the um, the Uzik criteria, which was a very nice checklist. Um, and we, we've we identified Nubian technology um, at this site. Um, and concurrently, another team working very close to us, uh, also independently, convergently, uh, identified this technology <laughs> and uh, were able to link it to um, uh, deposits in a rock shelter that give us an MIS3 age of about 50,000 years ago. Um, so the technological package is quite different. It's entirely separate from uh, in space and time from the, the Northern African um, examples. But it does present this really interesting test case in a desert environment in South Africa. You don't find anything like it in any of the well-known coastal cave sites. So it's raised this quite important question about whether environment has something to do with using this technology. Um, in 2016, uh, quite an important part of the debate is um, the publication of Nubian cores in the Levant. And bearing in mind the, the northern dispersal route um, that's been suggested as, as one of the routes out of Africa, this is quite critical. Um, so Mago de Goldberger and colleagues uh, studied old collections um, that have been collected by Tony Marks and various others in the 1980s in the Negev. Um, and they, they identify Nubian cores within these assemblages um, and proposed a diffusion with modification scenarios, so cultural diffusions of groups interacting with others as they moved out of Africa. And more recently, there have been some MIS-5 ages from negative flu fluvial ter terraces with Nubian core fine spots. And what's particularly interesting here is that in the, the very well-known record of the, um, uh, the Mediterranean zone, you pretty much don't find Nubian cores there. So it seems, again, a sort of ecologically related um, pattern. Uh, then things got messy. Uh, in 2021, um, a paper proposed that uh, Laval, Nubian Lavalwa was associated with a Neanderthal molar at Shukbar Cave, and that this demonstrated that Nubian technology had been the sort of underlying assumption, though rarely stated um, overtly, uh, was that this technology was not exclusive to Homo sapiens. And uh, as part of this, um, it was argued that Nubian cores were a byproduct of Lavalwa reduction. So if you're using other Lavalwa strategies, you might end up with some Nubian cores. Um, the objection that uh, a group of us, the main objection that we have was that actually Shukbar Cave, which is located in the, in the Mediterranean zone um, of, the, uh, of uh, Palestine, Israel, um, that the, the deposit itself was from a cave uh, excavated by Dorothy Garrod, and it was a huge deposit, and it was mixed. So we argued that actually there was no direct association demonstrated between Nubian technology and the Neanderthal molar, and therefore no convincing data were pre presented to justify that these uh, these cores were actually Nubian. Um, and I think the, the, the big issue here is not that Neanderthals couldn't have made Nubian cores, um, but it's actually, you know, if you think about the whole of Europe, there are no convincing Nubian cores there. And I think um, it's it's something that needs to be just demonstrated much more clearly um, before we, we roll with this argument. But what this did is it brought together um, a group of researchers working in um, a whole range of environments. And we held a workshop in Faro uh, to try and get to the crux of these issues and, and discuss them in purpose. Uh, so um, we aim to refine the definition of the Nubian technological method based on all of our experience in different regions and how we identify it usefully in assemblages. And uh, another major problem is, is what its role is culturally. And so we aim to reevaluate the relationship between Nubian lithic technology and the Nubian complex as a cultural entity. Um, so we published a, a short report on this and we have a collection in the Journal of Paleolithic Archaeology that's ongoing. I think a few more papers are going to come out of that soon. So if you're interested, please look out for that. 
Uh, and this is where my uh, my postdoc projects have come in, because I think what, what really struck me was that actually very few people had studied um, multiple assemblages from multiple regions. And what we really needed was an objective way or <laughs> a less objective way than uh, other um, attribute or, or chain operatoire sort of approaches. Uh, and another key uh, aspect was, was being able to replicate and share data. Um, so I looked towards 3D scanning and that's produced, I've now got more than two and a half thousand artifacts in my database and uh, from about 20 different sites. And one of the nice things is that we've been able to 3D print them and at the workshop, we could have people working in different regions actually handling and comparing cores together. So that's quite fun as well as its analytical purpose, which was to use geometric morphometrics to, to compare. Um, and so I've kind of been repeatedly going on about shape in Nubian cores. Um, and GM is used quite widely in uh, the biological sciences and increasingly in anthropology and archaeology. There's a great lab at PS doing, doing GM. And really, it provides a statistical framework for studying shape independently of size. Uh, there are many different ways of, of um, approaching it. There are 3D methods, 2D methods, landmark-based and um, elliptical Fourier-based methods. So uh, it has many potential, potential uses. Uh, lithic artifacts as non-biological specimens provide us, uh, present us with a few problems in identifying homologous points um, between so that we can compare between artifacts. But the highly structured geometry of Lavawa cores means that there are common features uh, between specimens that we can use to orientate them more consistently. Um, and there was there's been some really nice work by Steve Lysett and um, various others. Um, on, on Lavawa, but otherwise it's been quite rarely studied using GM. Um, but in uh, this 2013 paper by Lysett and von Kramer on Talbadel, um, they identified the greatest regional variability in the outline of a core shape and the least variation in the upper surface, so the, the, uh, the convexity of the, of the, the upper flaking uh, preparation surface. Um, and this implies that outline shape is the feature most likely to reflect regional or temporal traditions, and they in fact mention Nubian cores as perhaps one of the manifestations of this. Mm -hmm. um, so this is sort of one of the ideas that underpinned my interregional study. Um, I'm, my big question is, is there regional variability in Nubian core shape, and can this indicate relationships between assemblages? Um, so I've been super lucky with the assemblages I've been able to look at, and just here, um, I'll present on some of them. We have more samples that I, well, I don't know whether it'll add or complexify the the um, the pattern, but uh, I'll be talking about uh, sites from the Nile Valley, from Nubia and Sudan, um, from the original uh, uh, Nubia campaign, uh, from Nazlek Hatta, studied by, uh, excavated by Philip Van Peer, uh, some of the Negev surface sites, uh, studied by Goda Goldberger, and uh, some new sites, from Oman that haven't been published before. We collected the data in February uh, and my site is Twierfontaine in South Africa. Uh, so the method is probably a bit boring, but uh, we use landmark based GM um, and we, so using this, we had to identify common points that we could identify on, on all specimens. Uh, so we use the, the two uh, extremes of the proximal platform and the distal platform of the core is our three fixed landmarks. And we use semi-landmarks to capture the outline with three curves along the outline edge of the core and two surface patches that we placed over the, the upper and lower surface of the core. And this is a sort of method that we adapted from work by Archer and colleagues, and they did this on blanks. So it hasn't been entirely simple to uh, carry this um, slake-based approach over onto cores. Uh, so it's taken quite a lot of time, but I, I think we've got it working now. Um, and we're doing most of this uh, analysis and the, the resampling of landmarks in uh, morpho and geomorph packages in R. Um, so the basic principle is once we've got our landmark specimens, we then uh, do uh, Procrustes superimposition or generalized Procrustes analysis, which basically scales all of the landmarks and overlays them. So it removes size from the equation completely. And we're just looking at shape. So the first results, and this is the first time I've presented these results. Um, PCs one and two really show the most variance, um, uh, although it's not as 
greater um, uh, the patterns are, aren't as, patterns aren't as clear as one might identify in in biological specimens because of the oddities of of lithics. Um, so PC one um, this shows um, at high PC one values show elongation, uh, um, low uh, low values show sort of shorter, wider artifacts. Um, PC2 uh, accounts for 12% of variance, shows the it's the, the upper lower surface relationship. So it's um, uh, high values um, have a steep, uh, sorry, hang on. High values have a, um, a shallower distal ridge and low values have a steeper distal ridge. Um, so if we look at the assemblages um, and how they group, this was quite interesting and I wasn't entirely what I expected. Uh, Nubia and Egypt, shown in purple and blue, tend to group uh, up here, and they are generally wider with a shallower distal ridge. The Negev and Dofar tend to be elongated with a steeper distal ridge, and South Africa uh, tends towards elongated, but it has a middle range sort of in between all the others of distal ridge steepness. So we've got two patterns separating out here with South Africa in the middle. And this raises now a number of questions because why? Why have we got these patterns? So the rest of the talk, I'm going to take us through various scenarios that we're we're considering. So first up is raw material. Um, and this is um, perhaps the hardest to control for. Um, in Nubia, they're working with this very coarse ferrocrete sandstone. Um, from how I understand it, it's fairly abundant at the sites where they um, where these artifacts were collected but it's clearly going to have different working constraints to chert. Um, in Egypt, and I love this core because it's got a hole through the middle of it, they still picked it up and decided to nap it anyway. Um, in Egypt, they're using uh, chert cobbles that were available locally from gravels. And in fact, the Nazakata sites have been interpreted as chert quarrying sites. Uh, the Negev and Dofar, uh, we have these um, outcrops of, of flint or chert um, again, from my understanding and from our experience in, in Dofar, um, the, it, it's very abundant, close to these sites. Uh, and in South Africa, these are the, uh, the only assemblages that have very varied use of all materials. All the others are exclusively in the, the one or the other. Um, in South Africa, we have both hornfells, which is available as, as river cobbles just below the site, and non-local silkrete nodules that are, are brought in from at least 10 kilometers away. And something that's quite nice in at that site is that the silkrete cores are absolutely tiny and the hornfells cores are, are towards the bigger end. So it's at this stage, we can't really say the extent to which uh, raw material shape influences um, the later core shape. Um, but uh, it's a factor that we'll have to consider later. Size. So size is, is really why we're using GM is to remove size from the equation, but actually we do need to consider it factoring it back in. And I love this uh, example of a core from Dofar uh, that morphologically is very similar to my core from South Africa, but it's more than twice the size. Um, and so just here is a plot uh, in GM, we tend to use centroid size, which is a sort of, it's a relative measure of, of, of size rather than, than, than absolute dimensions. Um, but here you can quite clearly see that Nubia in Egypt uh, are much smaller than the Negev and Dofar, and South Africa is the smallest. And this is borne out also in, in raw metrics, not just in um, uh, comparing centroid size. So perhaps potentially we've got this uh, separation is actually in shape is actually related to size. So um, I did a, a, a comparison to uh, try and assess whether allometry um, plays a role. So allometric change in, in size is, is shape co-varies with size. And this is uh, opposed to isometry where shape and size don't co-vary. And it's calculated the regression on, of shape on centroid size. And then we do a Procrustes ANOVA. So that's comparing the distances between our scaled landmarks. Um, and the, um, uh, the, the goodness of fit test for this is Goodall's F statistics. So we have a very low value here that shows a weak positive correlation, although it's statistically significant. Um, but what's interesting when we look at the R squared coefficient of this is it, it less than 3% of shape variability is explained by size. Um, so from this, we can reject the, the idea that the bigger, the bigger cause from the Negev and Dofar is what's causing the separation in shape. 
So the next uh, feature that we need to consider is core preparation. Um, so I talked about the various distal and lateral strategies uh, in Egypt. Um, and these, uh, this graph here just shows the artifacts that were included in the, in the, the, um, the GM analysis, but they broadly represent the wider assemblage as well. Um, so in Egypt, uh, with predominantly uh, distal preparation, so that's just type one preparation. So far in South Africa have much higher proportions of type two lateral preparation, but most of the assemblages, except for Egypt, have some form of a combined distal and lateral um, uh, preparation that's been sort of grouped together as this combined type one slash two. Um, so if we then look at the same uh, PC1, PC2 plot, um, but instead of showing regions, we look at uh, a core preparation type. Um, we see this separation out of distally prepared cores. And uh, based on their um, low PC1 values and high PC2 values, uh, it seems that distally prepared cores are wider and have a shallower distal ridge. Um, but if you remember from our plot before, we had uh, Nubia in Egypt uh, falling in this range and our cores from Nasek Hata are predominantly type one. So it seemed necessary to then repeat this, but removing Nasek Hata from the equation. And we still see, although there's a much lower sample, we still see this pattern where type one cores with distal preparation have higher PC2 scores. So there's, there's something slightly different about them. Um, and if we look at these uh, profiles of the cores, so this is looking towards the distal, the, the distal ridge um, and the distal ridge you can see here it's this um, it's this angle is what I'm really talking about it's the angle between these two um, scars here and uh, I think actually this was quite surprising because a lot of us expected a uh, distal prepared distally prepared cores to have a steeper distal ridge um, so low PC2 values uh, whereas actually they appear to have a flatter distal ridge given the distal ridge is one of the defining features of Nubian cores this is quite curious. Um, so we'll need to do some more investigation on this, looking at more uh, samples that have um, uh, distally prepared cores in them. Um, but this is just one, one pattern that we've, we've identified here. Um, and the other issue, uh, if we're talking about uh, Lavalwa cores, is um, it's all about the, pre pre the preferential scar, the preferential product. So as well as landmarking the, the cores themselves, I landmarked the uh, final removal, which isn't always easy to identify um, uh, on, these, on these cores. And uh, so we just did an outline analysis of this. There was no, uh, no 3D sense of the core surfaces. Um, PC1 shows 52, accounts for 50, 53% of variance. And again, this is elongation and width, um, you can see here. Um, PC2 uh, reflected skew to the left or right, but there was no um, regional separation there. But PC3 is quite interesting because it shows um, either the proximal or the distal is where the greater, um, more of the, the, the shape is, is concentrated. So we have expanding shapes um, with low PC3 values and convergent shapes with high PC3 values. Um, and here broadly, we have the Egyptian uh, samples that have a short wide scar um, that are sort of ending up with flakes. The Negev Dofar in South Africa are much more elongated, narrow scars with these, we describe them as pointed blades. And Nubia is extremely varied um, uh, with variable el elongation and width. And these sort of list lie on a scale of, of flakes to points. Um, so again, uh, size is another factor here because we may be seeing the cores discarded at different stages. Um, so we did another allometric analysis. And while the uh, goodness of fit number is, the F statistic is much higher, it shows a moderate positive correlation. Still, the strength of this relationship shows that less than 9% of shape variability is explained by size. And this is going to be an important step in the next phase of my analysis is to ask um, if we, there are very few assemblages that actually give us large samples of end products, but Nasdaq Cather is, is one of these. We've got more than 100 end products of the samples. Um, but you can see clearly there are these elongated rather than classic triangular points. Um, Negev as well, very elongated. And Dofar, we've just got these three lovely refits, but they're quite variable. 
Um, and the next step is going to be comparing the shape of these with um, artifacts from the Levant using uh, unidirectional convergent methods. Uh, but you can see quite clearly that just from these examples here, um, the shape is very different. Um, so another big question is the assembled context of these, these cores, particularly if we're thinking about uh, dispersal or diffusion scenarios. Um, so just looking at uh, the other types of Lavalwa core that are present in assemblages. The samples from Nubia and Egypt, you get Nubian and centripetal cores being both being quite common in these assemblages. In the Negev, you have a much broader range of different types of Lavalwa exploitation. And in particular, you have bidirectional flake and bidirectional point cores. Now, this is quite important because uh, if we're just looking at products, as some researchers have, you will get bidirectional scars on some points, pointed products that don't come from Nubian cores. So I think this is going to be quite important to now start to compare the scar shape and the product shape on bidirectional versus Nubian cores. Um, and they, they, they clearly don't meet the other requirements of, of a Nubian core and its morphology. In Dauphin, we have a completely different um, scenario where the cores are almost exclusively Nubian. And this is not just true for the assemblages that I looked at, um, but for all of the assemblages they've, they've recorded. So this is where we have to zoom out to the broader regional context. And uh, there isn't really a clear picture here, but it's been conceptualized by some researchers working in the Levant um, who've basically sort of arrived at um, similar interpretations. Joe de Goldberger and colleagues uh, looking at the Negev identified two technological packages, as they've called them. First, one is the Nubian technological package, um, uh, that include these three sites that, that were in my sample. And with that, you have centripetal Lavalwa occurring alongside Nubian Lavalwa, but you have absolutely no convergent, uh, unidirectional convergent cores. But at some other sites in the in the Negev uh, that are also thought to date to a similar time frame, uh, such as Rosh Ein Mor and Nahal uh, there are uh, unidirectional convergent cores, but then no Nubian cores. So this is quite interesting because you've got two different strategies for producing points of potentially different morphologies, um, and uh, both groups in the Negev seem to be using uh, using them separately. Uh, and so Barzilai and colleagues uh, who in fact dated uh, Nahal Akev recently, um, or some terraces near Nahal Akev um, to MIS-5, then uh, suggest that actually you have two different sort of um, uh, ecological areas that th these different technologies occupy. And in the Mediterranean area, up here, the classic MIS-5 sites of school, Kafsa and then Goyla and uh, Nesha Ramla, uh, you have these uh, the unidirectional convergent method. And in the, uh, in the Negev, but also if you look further south towards the Arabian Peninsula, um, you have these, these Nubian cores. So potentially we've got two different technological packages that may be related due to cultural diffusion. Uh, more broadly, in Arabia and East Africa, which is the, sort of the other end of the uh, expansions out of Africa, northern or southern route, um, there have been uh, Nubian cores found in small numbers. It's not nothing like the high proportions that one finds in Dafar, um, but in northern Arabia, uh, Nubian cores occur alongside centripetal and, in fact, bidirectional, which is quite interesting, bearing in mind the Levantine cores. Uh, in Central Arabia, you also have Nubian and centripetal cores. Um, so it's raising this question, is there a dispersal route? Um, ultimately, uh, and there are other sites in Arabia that don't have any Nubian technology. Um, but if you think of the size of the Arabian Peninsula and the number of environments that haven't been studied yet, um, really there are far too many gaps to really say anything um, firmly one way or the other. It certainly seems that something quite odd is happening in Dofar. Um, but if we look at the um, the other potential route out of Africa crossing the Red Sea, uh, there are a number of cores that sort of are Nubian-ish um, from the Horn of Africa um, and some work by Manuel ben Bayin and colleagues um, along the coast of Eritrea and uh, southern Sudan, uh, which does raise this idea that, you know, you have got a link down the Nile from um, from further up in in Nubia itself. So given that at certain times uh, during MIS-5, uh, the Red Sea would have been only about four kilometers across, it's not out of this world to consider that as a possible dispersal route as well. But at the moment, we just don't have enough data points or dates 
on the map to be able to really say anything one way or the other. Um, and so just thinking a little bit broader about um, climate. So I've raised up several times the idea that these may be associated with arid environments. Of course, this isn't necessarily the conditions of the past. Um, for modeled MIS-5 rainfall, if you look at Africa as a whole, we do see uh, more nubian cores. Like I guess my perspective from South Africa is that in these better watered areas around the, the coastlines, there is no evidence of Nubian technology, and this is a very well studied part of the world, whereas in the interior seems to be where this, this technology is cropping up. Um, so MIS-5 is the time where there have been these uh, interesting green Sahara and Arabia models proposed as potential drivers of human expansion into these different environments. So I think it'll be interesting to see how more dates and more climate modeling um, fit together with the technological picture in the years to come. So to conclude, um, I don't think I can say anything clearly about the diffusion or dispersal uh, or convergence scenarios for North Africa, um, the Levant and Arabia yet, but I think this is a good start. Um, so just to, to summarize um, whether we're any closer to understanding demographical cultural relationships, Nubia, uh, in terms of core shape, shows the widest range of variability, which is quite interesting, given that this is where this specific type was was uh, um, defined. Uh, Nubian cores are, in fact, relatively infrequent. And as uh, Tony uh, succinctly put, Nubia itself neither has the highest representation of Nubian cores nor likely represents the origin point of this reduction strategy, which is quite interesting to bear in mind, given that we're using this word uh, to describe it. Um, in Egypt, we see similarities with Nubia, including this wide range of shape variability. Um, but at Nazat Kata, we have a uniquely high frequency of Nubian type 1 cores, so the distal preparation. Um, and uh, it's linked very much into, it's, it's one of the core sites at the heart of uh, Philip Van Pier's Nubian techno complex. Um, so whether Egypt was actually the source of Nubian technology, um, we still don't have enough data to say that yet, but it seems to be um, certainly in terms of raw numbers of, of cores at sites. Uh, Egypt and Dofar and my site in South Africa are the only ones that surpass 100 cores. Um, in the Negev, which is this critically in interesting area, the cores show a very different shape from North Africa. It shares the co-occurrence of centripetal cores with Egypt, but its bidirectional strategy is distinct. Again, we're looking at uh, surface assemblages, so an interesting problem that we may be encountering here is whether we have a palimpsest effect, um, but there are some new studies coming out that um, may help us to elucidate this. Um, so I think at this stage, I don't have any reason to reject the diffusion scenario proposed by Rode Goldberger or Barzilai. Um, now in Dofar, we see a lot of similarities with the Negev, which is particularly interesting, um, but they have a very different technological package with virtually no centripetal or bidirectional cores. Um, and Dofar is still um, potentially um, suggests a dispersal scenario, whether by the northern or southern route, we don't know yet. Um, but I think there'll be some interesting research coming out of Arabia in the future. And South Africa is perhaps our only clear picture. Um, it overlaps in shape with the other samples, which is maybe what we'd expect for convergence. Um, it's got a a distinct technological package and its age of about 50,000 years suggests local origins. So the next step in South Africa is going to be to compare it, the, the shape of our products um, to other methods found at uh, some of these coastal cave sites to try and understand why they were doing things differently in the interior. So I think we support a, a convergence scenario there. Um, so this is, as I said, this is just the start of the GM analysis. Um, I've got some really exciting samples to carry on uh, comparing it with, comparing the, these with. Um, and to address these questions that I identified at the beginning, does Nubian represent a distinctive Lavalwa reduction strategy? Uh, so the next step is to compare Nubian core shape with other Lavalwa core types, so centripetal, bidirectional, unidirectional convergent, and how these uh, occur in the same assemblages and when they don't, um, and to then look at end product shape and how these compare between different Lavalwa reduction met methods. Because if people are choosing to use Nubian for whatever reason to produce a certain shape of end product, we then expect to see differences with cores uh, that use a different preparation technique. Um, the sort of the, the big tricky question uh, about whether it reflects a widespread share techno complex, and this is particularly 
uh, this is the main crux of many of the, the heated debates about this. Um, the next step is to, to compare um, Lavalle core variability and assemblages in the same regions that do and don't have median cores. Um, and I've got some of these samples for uh, the for Egypt and the Levant. Um, and then the, the big, big questions over whether it tells us anything about human behavioral evolution or demographic histories. Uh, we need to look more at environmental trends. So uh, comparing negev assemblages with Mediterranean zones uh, that date to roughly the same time period uh, and looking at temporal trends. There's an interesting uh, case of uh, these micronubian cores in Dothar that have been called Mudayan. Um, and they're, they're much, much smaller. They're using the same uh, technological steps as, as Nubian um, producing Nubian cores, but they're tiny. Um, and it's made us wonder whether if we compare them to the, the cores of the Bokhtakti uh, in the Paleolithic, whether we see any similarities there that might help us place them later in time. Um, so I hope I've kind of whet your appetite for things that might be coming. Um, uh, acknowledgements, many people have helped me with um, access to various uh, collections. Uh, Joao Castellera at Icareb has helped me with developing the R script. Um, my funders, I had a Marie Curie Fellowship and I'm now funded by the FCT in Portugal. Um, and if I can just deviate for a second into uh, my other side project, if you'll excuse me. Um, so I've been, I do a lot of outreach work in South Africa, um, particularly in the, the Tangwa Karoo, this very arid area of uh, interior South Africa. And uh, I work a lot with a nonprofit uh, called Children's Book Network that aims to get children in remote areas excited about reading because there is this crisis of reading in South Africa. Um, so working with uh, children's author, Leslie Beek, she has written this beautiful story kind of inspired by 10 years of knowing me and hearing all about the trials of doing field work and then how you interpret results and also the sort of imaginings that we can't really do scientifically, but it's fun to think about actually who were the people in these landscapes? What were they doing? Um, so we've created this book. Um, it, we self-published it and uh, all the proceeds go to support the work of Children's Book Network. So if you're interested, there's a QR code there where you can email me or timetrackersbook at gmail.com and I can help you with a copy. Thank you very much. <laughs>